Well, welcome, everyone. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet just yet, I'm Martin Taylor, and I'm the, the physical secretary and the vice president here at the Royal Society. Uh, as I say, you're all very welcome here tonight, but if I may say in a very gentle way, you'll be just that little bit more welcome if you could kindly remember to switch your phones, pages, many noisemakers that you might have about you off. And in fact, it's a little bit stricter than that. I'm told, don't just put them on silent mode, but can you really switch the power off? Otherwise, it can uh, interfere with the, the acoustics, I am told. The Wilkins, Bernal and Meadow lectures were originally delivered as three separate lectures, each given triennially, and I'll tell you a little bit about them presently. But now what I want to tell you is that they've all three been rolled together with the idea that you can put them together then make one annual regular event, and in that way they will be a little bit more impactful and have sort of more, more sort of uh, importance for us. So I, I suppose the one thing that strikes me when I say in the order that they give us, Wilkins, Bernal and Medawa, had they ordered them in alphabetical order, we would have had the BMW lecture, and that would have been much easier for me to, re to remember. However, there's a reason that you will hear about in a minute for them having Wilkins up front first. So let me tell you a bit about each one. The Banal Lecture Fund was endowed by a Professor J.D. Banal for a lecture on some aspect of the social function of science. So that's where that part comes from. The subject matter for the Medawa Lecture was the philosophy of science or some other field that was in the interests of Professor Sir Peter Medawa. And I would add then that... Uh, philosophy of science, then this is where we would cite tonight's speaker naturally, Jeremy. He's a, the kind of the Medawa part of this trio. But finally, the Wilkins lecture was on the history of science and was given in recognition of John Wilkins, who was the first ever secretary of the Royal Society. So that goes all the way back to the 1660s, and I think it's for this reason that he is given primacy and moved to the front of the Wilkins Banal Medawa. Um, so tonight's lecture will be then the first ever of this new trio annual event, and will be given then by Jeremy Butterfield. And I just want to say a few words of introduction about Jeremy now. So Jeremy is a senior research fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge. And I would add, firstly, that that's my old college, but then possibly more importantly, it's the college of our president seated here at the front, who is, in fact, the master of Trinity. Jeremy's main research interests are philosophical aspects of quantum theory, relativity theory, and classical mechanics. And he has specialised in the philosophy of physics since 1987. After completing his PhD at Cambridge... He remained in Cambridge lecturing on the philosophy of physics before going to Princeton University as visiting assistant professor within the philosophy department there. Then after a period spent at the University of Oxford as a senior research fellow, he returned to Cambridge. So his life has gone round in one lovely loop and I hope you'll be very happy now at my old college, Trinity. Jeremy has edited and introduced numerous books I mentioned just three of them to give you the flavour. From Physics to Philosophy with C. Pagonis, the, argument, the Arguments of Time, and also The Handbook of Philosophy of Physics with John Ehrman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased now to present Dr. Jeremy Butterfield, who will deliver the first ever Wilkins Banal Medawa Lecture. And oh, I thought the title would be up there, so it isn't. The title is The Uses of Infinity. A philosopher looks at emergent phenomena in physics. Jeremy Butterfield. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you. Um, good evening. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Martin Taylor for such a gracious and uh, warm-hearted welcome. And uh, also to uh, thank you very much for coming to a, um, a bit of a roller coaster ride through some bits of philosophy, of science, and uh, 
a little bit of maths and physics. Uh, but uh, also I'd like to say, of course, uh, that it's a great honor and uh, a great pleasure uh, to be asked to give the lecture. And I'd like to thank the Royal Society and uh, the staff, especially Laura Howlett, uh, the events officer, for everything that has uh, made it so easy. Um, so I hope to stop at about 7.20. We would then have 10 minutes of questions. And uh, that means that uh, I'm going to perhaps talk too fast, skip over bits, but there's a reassuring aspect, and that is that the uh, handout corresponds to the slides. Uh, the other reassuring aspect is that I'm a novice to the slides technology, and therefore it may go slower on that account, or even backwards. <laughs> so um, in any case, the overall theme uh, is, um, is the whole uh, of an object in some sense greater than the sum of its parts? Or can you get a full understanding of an object, in physics jargon, a system, by uh, thinking of its component parts? So that big question, uh, answered yes or no, the, of course philosophers love isms, and so holism is the, uh, the yes answer to that question, that uh, you cannot understand wholes by a full understanding of their parts, and reductionism, uh, well, that's in a sense a vagarism, actually. It has many meanings, but uh, broadly speaking, it's the answer no. It's the, in particular, micro-reduction would be the more specific. I, one can fully understand a whole by analysing its parts, together with, of course, how they relate one to another. So that's the overall topic. And... Um, these last uh, 10 or 20 or even more years, emergence has been used both in uh, science, especially physics, and in philosophy to, as a buzzword or title for um, the idea, in effect, of holism or of anti-reductionism. Uh, maybe it isn't... Uh, as strong as some fully-fledged holistic doctrine you might write down, but it's certainly opposite to reduction. And uh, as you will almost all know, if you've been so good as to come through the cold and dark here, there has been a succession of uh, popular proposals, especially in the pages of New Scientists, so to speak, these last two or three decades, of big new ideas being propounded as the clue to understanding uh, large-scale systems or certain kinds of problematic system, catastrophe theory, chaos theory, complexity theory, cellular automata, and so on. Uh, this talk, actually, uh, will steer clear of those uh, snazzy ideas and uh, I, I believe they have their value, and I don't know anything about them, but I'm happy to take questions about my uh, dogmatic, prejudiced attitude, ignorant attitude. But it, I'm not going to talk about that. As you may have seen to your dismay if you looked at the handout, this uh, talk will actually say, uh, I'm going to try and make peace between two warring camps, the holists and the reductionists. And my friends always tease me about this because my ironic temperament makes me want to make peace between them. And, of course, being academics, they love having a good argument. So it makes me uh, unpopular, really. But I'm going to try and make peace in a certain narrow sense. Of course, if there are two isms, the two sides are bound to want to define their ism so that they truly disagree. And you can't make peace between contradictories. But... I want to urge that there are cases where good old reductionism holds. You do get a full understanding of something in terms of its parts. Uh, and nevertheless, because you've uh, got a rather snazzy theory of the parts, uh, novel behavior occurs in the whole. Okay, so that's the kind of piece I'm trying to urge. So, in fact, you see, since giving Laura Howlett my title, I, I brought you here under false pretenses because I've changed the title to my irenic proposal. 
Are they reconciled? Well, I think in some cases they are very clearly reconciled. Once, of course, I have the exercise my liberty to define emergence my way and reduction my way. Right? So, and in fact, uh, the other part of the title is that the cases I have in mind are cases where you use infinity and you thus get uh, a reductionist understanding of what I will call emergent behavior. Okay, so that's the overall idea. And uh, being a philosopher, it's a game of words, and uh, there is therefore jargon to be introduced. And here is, uh, I'm afraid, the jargon from philosophy. Well, I will take emergence to be a behavior of a thing, what physicists would call a system, I'll probably slip into that, uh, which is novel and robust. Those are comparative words, so there's some comparison class. Uh, it's novel compared with something else you had in mind, and it's robust in the sense that it's the same, even though other details may vary. So it's some kind of resilience or invariance or robustness. Other things vary, but this behavior remains the same. It's not fragile, it's robust. And this is especially novel and robust in comparison with some theory of the microscopic details, because typically one's thinking about reduction as reduction to the microscopic parts. There's a big, broad idea which is uh, endemic in science, which is choosing the right variables to describe your problem or the right approximation scheme to attack it with. And that is a deep and wonderful, multifaceted, broad subject. I'm not going to talk about it. Emergence doesn't just mean choosing good variables to describe a macro system for me. It, mean, it includes that, but it's the more specific idea that there's novel and robust behavior. Okay. So what is reduction? Well, here I feel a bit apologetic in the sense that there's a core idea that's been the same in philosophy for 50 years or more, and uh, it is, uh, in effect, much beaten, much weather-beaten, or uh, it's got the scars of war. It, people that say that isn't really what reduction is about. Nevertheless, it's the idea we're going to use tonight. Okay? And I think it's a, it's a core idea. Um, so, as it says, it's, it's what logicians call a definitional extension, and... Uh, my innovation tonight, so this I think is a pedagogic first, which I'm proud of. These discussions in the philosophy literature, they talk about theory T1, theory T2, their relationship, does T1 reduce T2, and you're always confused which is one, which is two. I abandon this for mnemonic labels. B for bottom or best or basic. That's something like the atomic theory of the microscopic details, or it's your later theory that you believe in now, having previously believed in a tainted theory, which is a top theory. It might be more superficial. It's only about the more observable aspects. It's thus tangible. Uh, the word observable, unfortunately, begins with an O rather than a T, so I had to go with tangible. Okay. So what philosophers say is that something like uh, the microscopic theory reduces the, the top theory. There's another apology to be made. The physics literature uses the opposite jargon. They, especially in cases where there is a number like the speed of light, which is crucial to the theory, which is called a parameter which you can imagine to vary or uh, in quantum theory, Planck's constant. So a physicist will say, top theory reduces to bottom theory in the limit of a certain parameter, like the speed of light going to infinity. So unfortunately, the two communities have the opposite jargon. And I'm going to stick with the philosophy, actually, with the philosophy jargon. So what does it mean for one bottom theory to capture completely in terms of content the top theory? What does it mean? Well, the, the idea coming from logic is bottom theory might not use the same vocabulary as top theory. They could talk about very different subject matters. So the words are different. But nevertheless, you can in some way deduce top theory how can you do that if, this, if the words are utterly different? 
answer. You, you add definitions to bottom theory of the special words that occur in top theory. You add definitions and it is not... People say, oh, well, a matter of definition, use words as you like, it's a free choice. But to succeed with the goal of deriving top theory, it's not, of course, a free choice. You need to judiciously choose the definition in such a way that within bottom theory, turning the, the, the crank of its derivations and calculations, you obtain the assertions of top theory. Okay? So the definitions may be very hard to find, and the history of physics and logic and mathematics is, of course, as we might say, littered with the names of monumental figures who have had the brilliance to find the judicious definition. And the logicians emphasize that these definitions can be very long. I mean, as, as defined, a definitional extension, it could be a million pages long, and it, that definition, it would still be a, play a role in a definitional extension. That, however, uh, seems you know, a, formal, a formal extra. So what would be an example? Well, I've written example query because it is contested. Um, thermodynamics is about heat and work, macroscopically, tangibly described, uh, steam in a boiler and so on. Statistical mechanics envisages that there are countless, well, finite number, but uncountably large finite number of atoms in the steam and gives a description of the steam or the gas or the fluid or whatever uh, in terms of uh, averages for very large finite numbers of atoms. So the words are in quotes, temperature, pressure in thermodynamics, words like momentum, molecule, and probability in statistical mechanics. But the late 19th century saw uh, what looked like a reduction of the one to the other. Though, again, you can define reduction differently and uh, uh, one can fight about it. But that's the kind of idea. Okay, so now there's more jargon from the philosophers. Supervenience was introduced, I think, into philosophy by G.E. Moore. Uh, it is a... a, a to let you out of the suspense or anxiety about another notion, let me just say... It's a weakening of definitional extension. It's a weakening. But, it, but the intuitive idea is uh, quite striking. It's that, never mind theories, there's a collection of properties, curly T for top, curly B for bottom. So it's a collection of properties. And you have the idea that there's a collection of objects. Sorry, there are two collections of properties. And there's a collection of objects that have various properties in curly B, and they have various properties in curly T. And you can ask the question, if I have two objects which utterly match in the catalogue, the classification, the taxonomy given by curly B, if I have two objects that are duplicates, replicas, Xerox copies of one another from the point of view of the description of curly B, must they therefore also match in curly T? If, if yes, we say... Curly T supervenes on curly B. And a standard example is uh, the mental supervenes upon the physical. And the standard example, or a standard example, is we arrange for a cat in a physiology laboratory to see yellow in the top left corner of its visual field for one-tenth of a second. Fine. We know that that can happen in very many different ways in terms of the visual cortex of the cat, even if you describe it in quite high-level, crude, tangible, physiological ways, like the rate of neuron firing in certain columns of cells. It can happen in very many ways. Slightly different cells, different rates. When you go down to a, a more bottom level of uh, cell biology, or even lower to molecular biology, you'll get even more ways to see yellow in top-left visual field. Okay? But suppose some demon scientist, sort of Star Trek situation, arranged an atom-for-atom -atom replica of the cat, and or at least of their visual cortex, that might be enough, and arranged for that atom-for-atom -atom replica to remain a replica of the cat for the entire tenth of a second, then, many people believe, that replica would also see yellow. 
So however your original cat happened to be seeing yellow in one of the many, many ways it could see yellow, by organizing a matching atom for atom, you forced to the replica to see yellow as well. Okay. So that's the idea of supervenience. And uh, it is a weakening of definitional extension. Uh, and there's a little argument that you can give why it is, in fact, corresponding to allowing infinitely long definitions. Uh, philosophers use the word disjunction to mean a sentence which has or, or, or in it. And so there's an infinitely long or, or, or. And the idea is, I will define C yellow in top left visual field as either this way or this way or this way or this way, where this way is some long description in neurophysiology. And the idea is that actually this doesn't just happen perhaps in any of many ways, but it can happen in any of infinitely many ways. Now, I am actually at heart a, a very strong gung-ho reductionist, and I'm very skeptical that there are infinitely many ways this can happen. If you have a suitably powerful language for your bottom, for your T bottom, your curly B. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really a fan of supervenience at all. Uh, I'm a fan of reduction. And this comes up in my... T oh, so uh, at the end of this slide, you'll be glad to know we've really sort of finished... Well, this slide and the next. We've finished the lecture. After that, it's just examples, right? But I thought, you know, catch you while you're fresh or the cocktails are still giving you that buzz and, uh, and tell you everything so there's no suspense. Um, so obviously I said I was going to make peace, so I want to say emergence is compatible with definitional extension, that core idea. And in fact, I'm going to give you three examples, and there will be a number. Uh, parameter means a number which you can think of as varying, and it's capital N. And it will take the, the eight on its side is infinity, and we're going to be considering cases where we actually have a parameter that goes to infinity. And in physics jargon, actually, it will, in a sense, be degrees of freedom, but never mind what that means. Um, and my, the, wh why is this peace? Well, one reason it's peace is that although there will be reduction, a definitional extension with n equals infinity, you could be forgiven for thinking of a, of a cousin theory that resolutely keeps n finite. It is a very natural thing to concentrate on finite n. And if you do so, there won't be reduction. And in particular, there won't be this uh, snazzy thing, the emergent behavior, the novel and robust behavior. The novel and robust behavior depends upon the n equals infinity case. And philosophers use the word salient to mean naturally comes to mind doesn't mean the same as relevant. Relevant means naturally comes to mind, and it's right that it comes to mind, because it's relevant. Right? Salient is weaker. Salient just means it naturally comes to mind. And there is a salient, weaker, finite N theory, which na okay, it naturally comes to mind. So you, when you think of that, you think, hey, there's irreducibility here. I, I, I've got this novel, robust behavior, but my finite N theory just cannot capture it. And you'd be right, okay? So to some extent, I'm making peace by saying that the warring parties are choosing slightly different N. The reductionist gung-ho, like me, is choosing N equals infinity. And the, hey, irreducibility advocate is got their mind on finite N. But I also want to say that supervenience is a red herring. Uh, uh, not just for, for the reason I said at the bottom of the last slide, but... Because it goes or, 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 and it does not tell you how those later uh, dot, dot, dots get filled in. There's no control. I'm not saying that uh, in a particular case you couldn't have some control on how to fill it in. But the raw idea of supervenience just is an infinite disjunction, open-ended, heterogeneous, no cognitive control over what happens down the tail. It's just that it could happen infinitely many ways. Well, we will have an infinity, but it's the infinity of taking a limit, n becoming ever larger, and we'll have lots of control. So we're better off. Um, now, 
If you've ever studied science at high school or at uh, first year of university, you will remember that when you studied, for example, fluids, you were told, of course, it's, it's actually made of atoms, and never mind quantum weirdness, imagine small balls, but there are countlessly large but finite number of them, even in a tiny cubic millimetre. And so, for example, we will uh, discuss the density of the fluid by a function which is uh, actually a function of ordinary real numbers. And you have then adopted what would be called a continuous model of the fluid. Similarly about the speed of the fluid. To each point in space you assign a density, to each point in space you assign a speed or even a velocity of the fluid. But that is really a, an idealization, if you like, an approximation. You've said, uh, of course, there's individual atoms. They have their positions, and density is really defined by mass in a volume divided by the volume, and I need to have quite a few in there to make much sense of density, and therefore this every point of space getting a density, that's really an idealization. You've imagined, uh, uh, actually, as the physicists would say, you have imagined that uh, a system that is described really by finitely many real numbers, all the positions and all the speeds of the individual atoms is now being uh, defined by a function on space, which is infinitely many degrees of freedom. Okay, you treat, in that sense, treating it as infinite. So there are three obvious justifications of taking n to be infinite, which are shared with models of fluids and my examples. Okay? Uh, they're listed there. What I want to emphasize is that although my examples have much in common with these models, uh, my examples will have this novel and robust behavior. Actually, there are aspects of continuous models of fluids which show striking novel and robust behavior, but I won't go into them. Okay? But I just wanted to say that this n goes to infinity is a familiar sort of thing, actually, whenever you use calculus to describe a fluid. So anyway, the three obvious justifications. It is much easier to do the calculus than to keep track of very large finite numbers. Many of you will know that in an average macroscopic sample of matter, there are one followed by about 23 or 24 zeros of atoms, which is called for short 10 to the 23. Uh, this is a very high number to manage in calculation, and it's better to use the calculus. So this is a simple phrase, convenience, but it is actually you know, perhaps the most important thing in the whole talk. It is impossible to overstate the value of that for understanding. It's also true that a finite system sometimes has special finite effects. They get weaker the bigger the system, uh, and they are things you want to ignore because the system is, in the relevant uh, discussion, pretty big. And the third is uh, just the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Nothing, like, nothing succeeds like success. A good justification for an idealization is that it works. Okay, so what's happening here overall in the fights in the coffee room about modeling a truly finite degree of freedom system with a continuous function or with an infinitely many degrees of freedom model? Somebody will say, now come on, 10 to the 23 is finite. And infinity minus 10 to the 23, so to speak, is still infinity. 10 to the 23 is big for you, a mere human, but it's nothing compared to infinity. But the reply to this that justifies the use of infinity okay, is, ah, uh, yes, but if you have a certain function, call it f, which is an assignment of numbers to other numbers, it's f for 10 to the 23 is about the same as f for 10 to the 46, which is 10 to the 23 copies of your previous example and so on, then F infinity is a good way to go. So it's not just good, it's sometimes even indispensable. That's the idea. Okay, so f next comment is to say that reduction sometimes is regarded as needing much more than just definitional extension. 
Uh, maybe, people say, this is philosophy again, the defined properties have to play a central role in the bottom theory, or they have to occur there. The, they shouldn't be arcane contrived, and they certainly shouldn't be a million pages long. That is a stretch, a stretch too far. It's an accident of the shape of the theories or the typography almost that by some very long and arcane definition in statistical mechanics you could write something and call it temperature and then deduce something in thermodynamics. No, you must have a kind of at-homeness of the concept of temperature within the bottom theory statistical mechanics. Well, that may be, and the philosophers could fight about the best definition of reduction. But the point is, it's certainly uh, satisfied in our examples that the bottom theory is rich enough, when n is infinite, to contain the defined properties. Okay, so that's the end of the, that's the, end of the lecture now. And, but this slide doesn't occur uh, on your handout, I'm afraid. This is, however, the first example. Okay. Uh, but don't worry, the next slide, look, that is on your handout, right? But it's better to have a picture than, than the words. So 100 years ago, uh, Poincaré and others were much involved in um, an idea, which is a rather beautiful idea for novel and robust behavior in the macroscopic realm arising from intricate uh, structure in the microscopic. So how does this work? Uh, imagine you have a roulette wheel which is divided into a large number of alternating arcs of red and black, i.e. a normal roulette wheel. For example, one arc per second, there are 360 arcs. They alternate. The, the, the croupier spins, actually I've never been to a casino, but you know, I've seen the movies. So the croupier spins, and it comes to a stop eventually. And there's a certain regime of spinning and of friction. And uh, you can imagine that it's a bit biased. But since this is a casino that at least manages to keep the customers a while, it's not so biased that it stops always on the same black arc. Right? So the bias favoring and disfavoring is for relatively large segments. Now, within a favored segment, there might be some variation of the bias too. But again, within a biased four segment, there is not totally wiggly bias. Not, for example, within a, a segment largest, say 30 degrees, for which there's a bias that it should stop, it's not within that segment completely biased in favor of the black arcs in that segment and completely prohibiting stopping on the reds. No, the bias varies pretty slowly across a favored segment. And the, what you might call the anti-bias, the prejudice against stopping, in a disfavored segment is also not too rapidly varying. So I drew a not too rapidly varying green line, which is the probability function for stopping at that arc. And zero to two pi, I'm sorry, that is jargon for zero to 360 degrees. That's just the, the various arcs. And I tried to draw a decent number of blacks and reds and notice that you would expect the total area shaded black to be equal to the total area of shaded red, roughly. Because although you could choose any green line you liked, uh, you've got lots of arcs. And, the, and it, 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 sorry, I said you could draw any green line you liked. It wasn't allowed to systematically favor the blacks, or even one black. It had to vary relatively smoothly. The gradient or the derivative of it mustn't be too great. It mustn't climb too fast or drop too rapidly. Okay, so that's, that's the method. So there's the, the words for what I've just said. It's a roulette wheel. It has unknown biasing, but these assumptions hold. Then you can be confident that the long-run frequency is about 50%. Reason? Any biasing regime, no matter how wiggly, can be eventually washed out by giving sufficiently large capital N. Okay, so now I've given you the punchline. I've given you the rough idea that uh, first, and now I've said I had a, a, a not too wiggly green line and I had capital N arcs. I'm now making the point that if you, if you choose a very wiggly green line, I can beat it 
by making capital N the number of arcs even bigger. Right? Um, and indeed, this is what Poincaré proved. OK, that's in jargon. It says, for any, for any uh, m- measure you choose of wiggliness, and for any greediness you adopt about how wiggly to be, I will, by having sufficiently many arcs alternating red and black, I will beat it and get my probability of red to be driven to a half and probability of black to be driven to a half. Sorry. Okay. Uh, So what's going on here? Well, equiprobability is my emergent phenomenon. I've got very robust... uh, uh, Equal probability, robust, because the green line could be one of a very large class. And the, if I take the bottom theory to be a rich enough model of the wheel so that it includes the postulation of various green lines, various density functions, and it's rich enough to consider the limit as n goes to infinity, then indeed I have a complete reduction of the emergent phenomenon. But if you saliently insist on only finite n, you can frustrate this emergent phenomenon in the sense that, I haven't written it here, but uh, for, any, for uh, any n, for any number of arcs, no matter how large, there is some degree of wiggliness that can drive the probability of red as close to one as you care to set. Okay. So th- that's just the other side of the coin about you don't get the reduction in the finite n. And that's the end of example one, okay? Example two is more fun, really, as it involves fictional characters. It also involves, um, uh, actually, a bigger, better story than mine tonight. It is this grand narrative across 400 years of mathematics of the generalization of, well, the apparatus of mathematics getting ever more powerful and deep and... uh, Wide, of wider scope. And you see this in the idea I've mentioned of the idea of a mathematical function. Right? And in fact, I'm going to treat myself to discuss this uh, in terms of Galileo and Euler before turning to fractals, because actually uh, 2007 is the 300th anniversary of the birth of, dare I say it, the greatest mind Switzerland has ever produced. And I I'm including Einstein in the shortlist, namely Leonard Euler. And compl- I mean, to, I said the word monumental figure before, but a monument among monuments. So we, it's his set- tercentenary. And, uh, of course, the Internet is full of information about him. So I recommend uh, Euler tercentenary would be a good thing to Google. OK, so as many of you will know, Galileo was, uh, apart from being a genius in his science was also a great stylist and a great propagandist for his style of science. And this is a famous quote where, from the good old days when philosophy and science were one, hence the first word, and uh, hence the phrase natural philosophy, common in the 17th century uh, and even the 18th. So here is Galileo saying that actually a a full understanding of nature requires the use of mathematics on pain of being condemned to a confused wandering in a dark labyrinth, right? But my point is not just that good old Galileo, and no doubt that's true, but the uh, whole uh, conception of mathematics has gone far beyond the triangles and circles and other geometrical figures that he mentions there. And you see, actually, there's my Euler uh, moment, my kind of bowing down at at his shrine for a moment. There was a dispute uh, in 1747 and 48 between D'Alembert, who had invented the first ever successful description of a vibrating string, which is a so-called wave equation. I decided to write it down. On the face of it, if you plucked the string, pizzicato violin, and made the initial configuration of that string be, again, an idealization, a, an absolute corner, there would not, that configuration is not described by that equation because that equation requires 
that F, which is the configuration of the string, the displacement from its, its equilibrium, it, it requires that F be uh, smooth. So a rounded corner would be all right, but not an absolute sharp corner. OK, so D'Alembert says, I've invented this equation, but to be honest, it cannot describe a plucked string. Euler is uh, an optimist. He says, we must now generalize the concept of function and generalize our conception of this kind of equation called the differential equation. So I quoted him a bit. And a, a, a magisterial historian and foundations of mechanics scholar uh, says, and whom I to disagree with, Clifford Truesdale, that Euler's view was actually very, very important for the history of mathematics and physics in the 18th century. Leibniz had maintained that nature is smooth and that, as we would say in modern parlance, math physical problems will always be solved by some function that is smooth. Euler takes nature as she comes and says we must adapt ourselves. As does heroine of the evening, Thomasina Coverley, who uh, you may have seen on stage, that, and I didn't bring you an image of her, but if you, if you Google Thomasina Coverley, you'll find many different images of her looking rather different. She's a fictional character in Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia of some 15 years ago. Uh, she meets a tragic end early in life. The scene is 1807 in an English country house, and uh, she has Septimus Hodge as a live-in, gifted, conscientious tutor, uh, who knows, of course, of her transcendent talent. And in the course of the play, we learn that Thomasina discovers catastrophe theory, chaos theory, fractals, which is our topic, and uh, thermodynamics as well. Uh, the play goes back and forth between 1807 and 1987, so to speak, uh, because there's a character, Valentine, who is a modern chaos theorist, and it's the same house uh, 180 years apart, and we go back and forth. And Valentine occurs in, in a later slide. So here is Thomasina saying to her tutor, I do my homework and I just get nothing but arcs and angles, but the world isn't like that. After all, you've given me some function to describe a bell, but why not a bluebell or even a rose? And then a pause. Actually, that's not in the text, but she should pause and then say, do we believe nature is written in numbers? <laughs> Echoes of Galileo. We do. Well, then why do your equations only describe the shapes of manufacture? Armed thus, God could only make a cabinet. Septimus is not an optimist. He believes that nature outstrips all possible mathematical description and says God has mastery of equations that we cannot follow. Whereas Thomasina, Lord Byron never is on stage, I should tell you, but he's around the house, okay, in 1807, that is. And, uh, and so because he is indeed a salient character in the play, she ends her rebuke of optimistic let's get going by saying Lord Byron will be dead and forgotten. Okay. So what's the idea of the fractals? Um, the idea is, for us, that we're going to introduce a special sort of object. It's not going to be like a triangle or a circle or a square or a cube or a rectangle or a cylinder or a sphere. Those are familiar, and you would say that a square has dimension two and a cube has dimension three, a sphere has dimension three. You're used to the idea that objects have dimensions, and these are whole numbers. Fractals are going to be new sorts of object in the sense of they're a set of points, and we'll only look at a set of points lying in the plane of our slide or a plane of our paper. But this set of points is going to have a dimension in a natural sense, which is not a whole number. Okay. So there are various ways of approaching this. We will use the idea of a scaling dimension. Okay, and I'll try to do this relatively rapidly. Obviously, if a square had leg edge L, L for length, it would be a union of L squared unit squares. Look at the examples on the left. The dimension is 2. And 2 is in the exponent. 2 squared is 4 and 3 squared is 9. When you go to dimension 3, you see the cubes. Again, 3 is in the exponent, means a power, upstairs, superscript. So the idea is there that the number of unit blocks in an object with a certain 
edge or length psi L is L to the dimension of the object. Okay? That's just saying the same, and that's on your, on your handout. And objects can be written down. The first one was in 1872 by Cantor, uh, which uh, ha obey that equation, but with the exponent not being a whole number. Just like the square and the cube, they are unions of shrunken copies of themselves, uh, but they... They, do, they are very curious when you first see them, uh, and they are, they're, 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 that exponent cannot be a whole number. Now, this, this is actually a slide about the Cantor set, which I won't go into. It is a certain subset of the numbers between 0 and 1 obtained by making an infinite process. Uh, and th that infinity, taking an infinite process, is, to go back to my main theme, that is our capital N. The Cantor set has a good old whole number dimension, no funny business, straightforward, some little subset of the interval from 0 to 1. That's what it is for finite n, but that's not the Cantor set. The Cantor set is defined by an infinite process. Okay. And what we actually get is that the dimension has to be, never mind what logs are, it has to be, Points, about 0.63. Similarly, in 1906, Koch uh, invented another set, then regarded as pathological because it wouldn't have a dimension that uh, you would call uh, a whole, that, is, that is a whole number. And he said, begin with an... He, he again had an infinite process, and the Koch snowflake is the limit of this infinite process. It is not obtained at any finite stage, the uh, stage uh, zero is an equilateral triangle. You're told on every side, please replace a side by, so to speak, uh, a sleeping policeman of, um, what was she, of aggressive demeanour. Or rather, this is the kind of car park block that you see when you're trying to get out of the, uh, the solicitor's car park after hours, right? So uh, in any case, you know what, that's the generator. So this process is done once, twice, three times, four times. And you see it begins to look, uh, look a bit like a snowflake. So what's happening? To wrap up this example, uh, well, non-integer dimensions are novel. They're robust in various senses we could discuss. So indeed, we have emergent dimensions. But we have a complete reduction. If TB is the modern theory of fractals with the power to describe these non-integer, not non-whole, integer is just another word for whole number, a non-integer dimension, uh, if TB is that rich theory, then of course it contains TT, the top theory, which is this description of, uh, of uh, the non-integer dimensions. Okay, so to finish, I would like to uh, say, and this corresponds to your handout again, you'll be glad to know, uh, I've been in the realm of mathematics in this example, not even probability theory, let alone physics. But fractals have been used in the sciences, including physics, to describe many, many different things. So having been in the realm of mathematics, we now naturally ask this question, is fractal geometry actually the geometry of nature? And I would like to distinguish two questions. Do fractals in fact describe the geometry of leaves, Ferns, mountains? Well, it looks like it. Look at the bottom of the page. And in Arcadia, Valentine describes exactly this kind of point by point building up of an image of a leaf. Right? So there's Valentine and there's the illustration for him. So he so Valentine says, yes. It, but the official answer from a philosopher now being boring, rigid, but you know. I think, correct, you have to say, well, actually, no, leaves are not like that. So the strict answer is no. But on the other hand, often a property does obey a power law. Fractals come in, and it's heuristically very useful to have fractals. It's even indispensable. And so to this second question, bottom of this page, the answer would be yes. Do some of our best physical theories make indispensable use of uh, fractals in their abstract spaces? 
Yes, they do. And statistical mechanics is an example. My third example is about boiling and freezing, which we won't go into. And my final remark is to say, I only scratch the surface. The, there, are, there are other examples. But sections five and six are indeed on your handout. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. Now, we now move to questions mode, and I perhaps just begin by explaining the rules of engagement here. I think we've got, yes, we've got about 10 minutes. Well done for the timing there, Jeremy. Uh, what I will do is I will, we've got two roving mics, and I will sort of designate questioners. And when those questioners pose their question, I would ask that you try and keep them brief, because with only 10 minutes to go, we can sort of get through a few questions like that. So do, do we have a first... Oh, wow. Well, I'm always picking people at the front, usually. So the gentleman with the beard, right at the back. There we are. Yes. Thank you very briefly. Oh, yes, stand up. Stand up. Okay. The uh, uh, concept of infinity is obviously linked with our conception of the cosmos, you know, 10, 10 23 or 10, 100, doesn't matter, i.e. universe. Now, recently has been finally found out, Cambridge mathematicians, that it is very feasible that actually we may be even inhabiting not just one, but poly, multi, verse. Consequently, the concept of infinity has to be enlarged even more, which is paradoxical, but beautiful. Can you say that's something all this? Yeah, um, okay. So um, this is not really the topic, but the multiverse uh, has various versions. One version is that some things I mentioned at the very beginning, like the speed of light or Planck's constant, which we find to have a certain value, might have taken other values that all people would be perhaps willing to say initially, but that they do in fact take other values in other regions of a multiverse or which we have no access to. And uh, this idea is uh, obviously powerful, attractive, exhilarating, contentious. Uh, the thing that I... The connection to what I discussed was that there is a second uh, big narrative behind this emergence or holism versus reduction, namely uh, the unity of nature. Uh, it isn't just that mathematics has got more powerful, as in my second example of fractals. It's also true that since Galileo's time, we have been much luckier than we could ever claim to deserve to be in finding underlying unities in nature, both of laws, of material constitution. Uh, for example, helium was first identified by analysing the spectra of starlight and called helium because it was believed that it only occurred in stars and couldn't occur on Earth, it was discovered to to occur on Earth. So there is indeed a deep unity of nature of many different types. The multiverse is, uh, in a way, uh, saying that the unity is only local. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, there's a gentleman there. That's right. The mic's with him. Right. Uh, strange attractors often turn up in emergent behavior. And like the Serpendensky Triangle, it turns up when you play the chaos game with, with you know, a dice. And it turns up with cellular automata, rule 90 that Stephen Wolfram made up. Why do you think strange attractors exist in the universe, which are stable patterns just turn up? Um, why do I think that there are strange attractors in so many fields? Um, this is a deep question that I don't know the answer to. I, I, I meant to say, but probably didn't, that, of course, needless to say, I don't know much about my examples. Uh, and, and it's an honor... I mean, I don't feel too sheepish about it, because as anyone here will appreciate uh, people spend their whole working life in one such example. Right? So I don't know, actually, a deep reason why strange attractors occur in uh, many different uh, fields of physics or science generally. Thank you. There's a lady there, and then there was a, after that there's a gentleman there. Uh, do you think the concept of infinite space is innate in human beings? Uh, no, I don't, actually. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's surely... A, um, um, well, there's two aspects to the, my answer, I guess. One is 
um, there's this broad uh, there's this broad question of how could you ever have a concept except by building it out of concepts you already had and so uh, it's rather like my very very long definitions uh, picture uh, if, if it's indeed true that in a sense you compose ideas from basic ingredients then it doesn't really much matter whether you think the ingredients are there at birth and in that sense innate or a result of maturation up until the age of three or five so that there has to be an environmental input but it's not a cognitive process it's a maturational process not a learning process and then you've got the building blocks and then you perhaps if that's the answer about how we have concepts there's a either innate or maturational and then you've got the ingredients and after that it's all composition well then in that sense since we have the concept of infinite space we've we've got it from basic ingredients but that's a kind of very philosophy of psychology sort of answer the second half of the answer would be uh, surely it isn't innate because it was an enormous struggle for Galileo and his contemporaries to envisage space as infinite in all directions okay um yeah sorry I hope I don't mean to uh, take this back into mathematics or, or whatever, but um, is there an analogy between um, holism and reductionism and um, the mathematics of uh, trying to find the answer to a problem by uh, approximating a function or approximating the solution, like with finite element methods or finite difference methods? Um, can, do you think there is maybe an analogy there? Um. I, I have to admit that there's more of an... Uh, broadly, my answer would be that there's more of an analogy between uh, your topic and my examples I happen to choose than between your topic and the general debate of emergence and holism. Because, um, you know, that general debate is, of course, many-sided. Uh, I decided to choose... Uh, this kind of example of n goes to infinity. That's very close to your finite element methods because it's a lot like what I said about uh, when you first model fluids using uh, a continuous function. So thank you. That does bring home uh, the uh, scientific importance of numerical analysis, even though one applies it to a continuous model of a fluid. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So uh, that kind of completes our questions section. We now move to what I, I call the most formal, in some way the, the nicest part, because I'm now going to make the presentations. So if, Jeremy, if you can just move round to the front. We, apparently we make, we make the nicest possible image for the camera like that. So if we move round here, I'm going to present Jeremy with a certificate, a medal, and even a check. So congratulations, Jeremy, on having the first ever Wilkins Bunnell Medal Lecture. Well done. Very well given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Splendid to hear the question. So here we are. Thank you very much. You can next to me. I'll just make okay. a brief photo. Okay. 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 So, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Okay, so um, it now falls to me really to draw matters to a close and to thank Jeremy for a beautifully constructed lecture with, uh, it really appeals to me as a pure mathematician, a lovely interplay between abstract theory illustrated then by many examples. Jeremy, you clearly have not just an ability but a very great desire to communicate with your handouts, a lovely lecture and apparently your first ever set, first ever set of slides well, they were very successful, you see, because you didn't do too many of them. Usually they whiz by and one loses, loses the track. You did that just right. So uh, make, make, that was really good. Okay, you keep going at that, yes. As I say, I'm a, I'm a pure mathematician and in, in my kind of everyday life, I sort of use infinity um, an awful lot. I would say infinities of all different sizes as well. I think we, for the most part, saw only one sort of infinity today, but... Uh, I use that a lot. Choice of variables, I know, is terribly important. But if I would say in my own field, the thing of cardinal importance is the 
the idea of getting definitions just right, then things have the ability to fall into just right focus. So my kind of everyday experiences as a mathematician were brought into wonderful order by what you were saying. And I would just add also, I am a huge fan of Euler and would place him up there with the very greats, as I think you did just there. So you see, I benefited greatly from today's talk, and I hope you all did as well. Jeremy, thank you for a lovely talk. Well done.